This program is a video presentation via Zoom of the Civil War Roundtable of the District of Columbia. Founded in 1951, the Roundtable hosts monthly presentations at a location near Washington, D.C., more recently at the Fort Myer Officers Club. For more information, go to www.cwrtdc.org. We have a very full and very interesting program ahead of us. It is my honor and privilege to introduce as our speaker tonight, Deanne Blanton. Ms. Blanton retired from the National Archives and Records Administration in Washington, D.C. after 31 years of service as a reference archivist specializing in 18th and 19th century U.S. Army records. She was recognized within the National Archives as well as in historical and genealogical communities as a leading authority on the American Civil War, 19th century women's history, and the history of American women in the military. Her groundbreaking book, They Fought Like Demons, Women Soldiers in the American Civil War, which she co-wrote with Lauren Cook, was published by Louisiana State University in 2002 and by Vintage the following year. Ms. Blanton is a founding member of the Society for Women and the Civil War, and she served as the first president of that organization. For more information about her group or that group, visit swcw.org. Ms. Blanton is a graduate of Sweetbriar College, and she now makes her home in the Shenandoah Valley. Again, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce Deanne Blanton. Welcome, Deanne. Thank you so much. I'm going to talk to you today about women soldiers in the Civil War. And I think the first question people always ask about women soldiers is, well, how many were there? And my answer is, I have no idea. Absolutely no idea. The the women who served as soldiers were passing as men because of course in the civil war women were neither allowed into the military or expected to serve their country and so they had to pass as men and because they passed as men it really is impossible to know exactly what their numbers are and the extant documentation that we have about women in the ranks is heavily skewed towards those who were discovered. If they weren't discovered while they were in service, it's very difficult for us to know, to know how many there were. So then the, the next question we get is, well, how did women possibly get away with serving as men with pretending to be men and well a large part of that question is answered by the fact that these were victorians we're talking about and victorian society was so rigid in their definition of gender roles and they were extraordinarily rigid in their definition of dress. Men wore pants, women wore dresses. It was really that simple. Your, your average person living in 1860s America had no idea what a woman even looked like in pants. And so at a casual glance, if an individual was in pants, they were male. And this greatly aided women in trying to become men. So what they really had to do was bind their breasts, cut their hair, put on some men's clothing, and nine times out of 10, that was all it took to start passing as a man in the ranks. Now, once they were in the ranks, it got a little trickier. And women had to try to sort of emulate the mannerisms of the men around them. 
But because we have been able to document literally hundreds of women who were successful for either a short or a long period of time, women clearly became pretty good at imitating the men around them. So women got into the ranks by pretending to be men. And as y'all already know, the surgeons weren't doing their job when they were doing enlistment exams. Uh, Sarah Edmonds, for example, said that her enlistment exam with the surgeon was a firm handshake. So women were able to very easily enlist because also people didn't carry ID in the 19th century. You could be anyone you wanted to be. It, there was a freedom then, at least for um, Caucasian people, to move to another town and just make up a new identity for yourself. And as long as you didn't run into someone you knew, you had a new identity, you had a new life. And women took advantage of, of this climate. But some were found out and thankfully they were found out because they're the women that we largely have documentation of. And sadly, one of the ways that women were found out is when they were dead. So we know that at least one Confederate woman was in Pickett's charge at Gettysburg because when Union troops were burying the dead uh, long after the battle, there is an asterisk in a burial report that one of the Confederates who was buried was a woman. We'll never know who she was. She was buried with all the other unidentified Confederate soldiers but she was there. And the only reason we know she was there was because the burial detail was probably rifling the bodies, uh, looking for either identification or valuables. But that burial report with this asterisk is in the official records. Other women were discovered because they were wounded. And typically in army uh, camps, the only time you might take off a great deal of your clothes is if the surgeon's probing your wound. So some women combatants were discovered because they were wounded. Women were discovered um, because they were in close quarters. When the army's in camp, they have the latitude to uh, find someplace private to deal with sanitary matters. If they're in close quarters, that would lead to discovery. And I got ahead of myself, but since the slides here, here are battles during the Civil War that we have, that myself and others have been able to document had at least one woman combatant. And so literally women were in the ranks pretty much from the beginning to the end. And like the men with whom they served, women were subjected to all the horrors of war and they were taken prisoner. And women combatants, uh, women soldiers, women in the ranks were discovered at these military prisons. And becoming a POW was almost a guarantee that a woman's um, sex was going to be discovered because she no longer had that latitude to find privacy. In most cases, officials did not want women in their prisons. And for most of the women who became POWs, they were released before long, not necessarily released from custody, but they were released from the prison because the commandants did not know how to deal with a woman in their midst. They felt that suddenly uh, civilian gender roles would apply to these women. And interestingly, many of these women who were captured waited until they were found out. They did not come forward to reveal veal that they were women. They were determined to continue their service just like the men around them.
so this is Sarah Edmonds. Sarah Edmonds is probably the most well known of women soldiers in the Civil War. And this is largely because she wrote her memoirs. Now, her memoirs are highly fictionalized because when she wrote her memoirs, she was writing them for a Victorian audience. And so she was very cagey about how she was really in the army. And she couched everything in her narrative in acceptable Victorian themes. She said that she went to war for love of country because that was an acceptable reason for women to step outside of societal norms. But Sarah Emma Edmonds was an interesting person. She was Canadian. She grew up on a farm in Canada, but she ran away from home as a teenager because her father was trying to marry her off to someone she did not want to be married off to. And she escaped her father and escaped Canada by dressing as a boy. She knew her father would chase after her. So she put on her brother's clothes and made her way to Michigan under the alias of Franklin Thompson. And once she arrives in Michigan and she has no family, she has no friends, she decides that her best course of action is to maintain this persona of Franklin Thompson because women are allowed, I mean, excuse me, men are allowed to make their way in the world independently in a way that women are not. And for both personal protection and financial freedom, she continues to live as a man. And so while living as a man, the Civil War breaks out. And on May 25th, 1861, Franklin Thompson enlists in the 2nd Michigan Infantry. There is a military service record for Franklin Thompson at the National Archives. There is a pension application file. Franklin had a very good career in, in the second Michigan. At one point, um, Franklin was detailed to be a regimental nurse. At another time, Franklin was detailed to be the regimental mail carrier. Franklin was detailed to be an orderly to General Poe during the Battle of Fredericksburg. She, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Franklin Thompson contracted malaria during the, pen, uh, the Peninsula Campaign and would ultimately desert her regiment on April 19, 1863 because she was suffering a flare up of malaria and she was sick and she was scared to go to the hospital because she probably rightly feared that if she went to the hospital that she would be detected as a woman and rather than be sent out of the army as she later wrote in shame she would rather desert and that's what she did and she made her way to some friends she recovered and while she was recovering from malaria is when she wrote her memoirs about life in the army after her memoirs were published, Franklin Thompson resumed her identity as Sarah Edmonds. She went back to living as a woman. Uh, she married in 1867. She had three sons. And in the 1880s, uh, she was in very ill health and wanted her soldier's pension. There were two problems. First, she had to prove that she was, in fact, Franklin Thompson. And second, she had to do something about desertion because, of course, deserters couldn't get pensions. So Sarah went to her regimental reunion as Sarah. And not surprisingly, the men with whom she had served were, um, as the kids would say, shook. But an interesting thing happened after that. When they realized that, okay, Franklin Thompson, our old friend Franklin, is now Sarah, they accepted her. 
And she went to her regimental reunions for the rest of her life. And I think this is an example of how the bonds forged in war, the comradeship of brothers in arms trumped any other social norms. And when she petitioned to have her charge of desertion removed to then pave the way for her to get a pension, her commanding officer, many of the men with whom she'd served wrote letters in support. And ultimately by act of Congress, Sarah Edmonds got a pension. She died in Laporte, Texas on September 5th, 1898 and was buried in the GAR section of the cemetery. This is Rosetta Wakeman. And Rosetta Wakeman is probably, I always say she's the most typical of the women who served in the Civil War. And the reason I say that is because Rosetta Wakeman was a farm girl. She didn't come from money. In fact, the vast, vast majority of women who entered the military of both the Union and the Confederacy were working class. They were immigrants. They were pioneers. They were yeoman farm girls, many of them not well educated. And Rosetta Wakeman is, she just fits perfectly into the larger scope of the type of women who went to war. So Rosetta Wakeman grew up the oldest child on a farm in upstate New York. She was her dad's chief farmhand. So she was definitely accustomed to hard work at a young age. When she was about 17 or 18 years old, she left the farm and got a job as a maid because her family was deeply in debt. And she thought that if she sought employment, she could help. Well, the wages were pretty sad for a farm girl who's now somebody's housemaid. And she decided that she was going to pretend to be a man so that she could get a better paying job. And she did. She cut off her hair. She changed her first name to Lyons. And she became a boatman on a canal. On August 30th, 1862, Lyons Wakeman enlisted in the 153rd New York Infantry because $13 a month was more money than she had ever seen before. She enlisted, she spent a good deal of time in DC and in the defenses of Washington. She was on guard and provost duty in Alexandria. And she wrote letters home. So in her case, the reason we know about Rosetta Wakeman is because she wrote letters. Her parents, her sisters, they knew exactly what she was doing. And her sister saved all the letters and then they were passed down through the family. Rosetta was sending her paycheck home. She was writing to her family. Sadly, she would never make it home to upstate New York. Her regiment was transferred to the Red River campaign. And that is where, like so many other soldiers, she ended up with chronic diarrhea and unspecified fevers. And she died in New Orleans on June 19th, 1864. She is buried in Chalmette National Cemetery under the name Lyons Wakeman. You can visit her grave. What fascinates me about her death is she lingered in the hospital in New Orleans and nothing in her military service record indicates that anyone ever noticed that Lyons might be female. And that either speaks to how little care these poor soldiers had 
or that it was discovered and not documented. But in any case, uh, Lyons Wakeman is buried in a national cemetery. Okay, you have to guess which one is the woman. So uh, the soldier without the beard is Albert Cashier. And we call this the buddy picture. And this is Albert Cashier, who was born Jenny Hodgers in Ireland with a comrade. This is Frances Clayton. And Frances Clayton, uh, these are her, what I call her glamour shots. So these were taken after she had left the army. So Frances Clayton was also kind of a quintessential woman soldier in that she went to war with her husband. And of the women that we have been able to document, about a third of these women did go to war with their husband, their fiance, uh, their brother, their dad. Frances Clayton went to war with her husband. She served in a Missouri regiment. He was killed at Stone River. And after his death, she decided that she didn't want to stay in the army. So she played the, the woman card confessed her true uh, sex and was discharged. But then she had to make a living for herself now being widowed. So she went on the lecture circuit. And these are studio photos that were taken basically for publicity. And these photos would be used uh, in advance of her lectures. So she went out on the lecture circuit after the war and then she kind of disappears from the historical record. And we don't really know what happened to her at the end of her lecture circuit. She just kind of disappears. And sadly, that's what happened to a lot of the women that we document. They kind of, we lose their trail. And that's quite possibly because they didn't want to be found. It's possible because women's names change. If, if, for example, if Frances Clayton remarried, we don't know what name to then look for her under. This is Frances Hook. These pictures of her were taken in the hospital. So Frances Hook went to war with her brother. They were orphans. When he said that he was going to war, she didn't want to be left behind and alone. So she went with her brother and her brother gets killed. But unlike Frances Clayton, Frances Hook decided that she was staying in the army because the army had become her family. Her brother was dead, but she had her comrades. She had the other people with whom she served. They had become her family. So Frances Hook, who was serving under the name Frank Miller, she stayed in the army. And in fact, she was not discovered as a woman until she was captured in December of 1863 near Florence, Alabama. She was sent to Atlanta as a prisoner of war and while in Atlanta, got shot in the leg, attempting an escape. That's when the surgeon discovered that she was female. So the Confederates uh, exchanged her under a flag of truce in February of 1864. She was sent to Chattanooga to a Union hospital, later transferred to Nashville. And she recovered in the hospital in Nashville for a couple of months before uh, doctors there felt that she was well enough to be sent home. Now, in her case, she was discharged from the army immediately, but they did not kick her out of the hospital until doctors felt she was well. Many of her fellow soldiers in the hospital were worried about her and how she would fare once she left federal protection. So these two pictures were taken of her 
and they were sold to they were sold basically to the other soldiers in the hospital to raise funds uh, for her when she was discharged. And when the time came, she was pretty much unceremoniously put on a train and sent north. We lose her trail after that until 1908, when her daughter, Maggie, wrote a letter to the War Department asking for her mother's military service record. So we know that by 1908, Frances Hook had passed away, but her daughter's letter does inform us that at some point she married, she had a family, and told her family about her military career. This is Martha Lindley. This is another woman who told her family about her military career, and that is her sword and her pistol, which is still in the custody of her descendants. Martha Lindley went to war with her husband. They served in the cavalry after the war, and obviously that is a post-war picture of Martha Lindley. It was common knowledge in her family that both mom and dad were veterans. And then later, both grandma and grandpa were veterans. And the sword and pistol of the couple have been passed down through the family. So this picture really illustrates the difficulty in researching women soldiers. I, I, I've mentioned before that, that what we know is heavily weighted towards women who chose to tell their own story or who were found out during service and their story was told by others. So here's Cora's sister. Uh, on the back of this picture, that is the caption. So I don't know who this is. There's no clues other than Cora's sister served in the Civil War and she was killed. And, and this picture makes me wonder how many other women are the equivalent of Cora's sister that we will never know their name. We don't even know anything about this soldier except it's an awesome picture. And if someone hadn't have written that caption on the back, we wouldn't even know that this was a woman soldier. But one thing that I think is important to note about the women who served is that they were full soldiers and they were allowed to be full soldiers because they were pretending to be men. They were passing as men. And because they were perceived as male, they were given the same duties as every other soldier. They were treated the same as every other soldier. And they were judged the same as every other soldier. And so when we look at what was being written about individual soldiers. What is very telling to me is what people wrote about them when they were still being perceived as men. For example, Albert Cashier, who was never discovered while in the service, what was written about Albert Cashier is that he was a faithful, reliable, hardy soldier. And what was written about Albert Cashier after his sex was discovered is, wow, was he crazy? So, and, and Cashier is an interesting phenomenon in itself because most women soldiers at some point in their life 
went back to living a female identity. Albert Cashier is an exception in that he did not. This is Loretta Velazquez, who is a very controversial figure. Um, she's only the second woman soldier to write her memoirs. And these are illustrations from her book. And um, gender historians and military historians like to argue about was Velazquez a fraud? Was Velazquez a real soldier? Uh, somewhere in between. I have always maintained that Velazquez's memoirs are not reliable, but that there are other sources that indicate that she may have served at some point. And I think among people who interest themselves in Velazquez, it's a debate that probably won't end. I think one thing I've neglected to mention about women soldiers, because I would like to leave some time for questions. I talked earlier about how women were found out as, as being women. And one of the ways that was foolproof is that at least five women were not detected as women until they had babies, until they went into labor and delivered a child. In fact, one woman went into labor on the picket lines at Fredericksburg. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we, I'm so glad we were able to schedule you, reschedule you. Um, this was a very interesting topic. Thank you very much. Wonderful topic. Mind-blowing, though. <laughs> there are so many questions. <laughs> you, you touched upon why they did it. Some were running away from a situation they didn't like, um, mm -hmm. but uh, some were running for you know, to get a job that was better paying. Um, boy, but that's a rough, uh, rough existence there to. Uh... Well, it, well, it is. And I think that's why, um, that's why it's important to, to point out that most of these women were working class and, and, and for women in poverty, the army was clearly a step up and, oh, I see a question. Uh, did any women make officer? Yes. Uh, we have uh, one woman, well, she was a non-com. And then in the Confederate army, there was a woman captain, but she was married to the major. So I think there was probably some nepotism involved in that. Um, but back to back to the point of women, you know, that the army was an escape. It was an army. Um, it was an escape from poverty. It could be an escape from an unhappy home life. You know, one thing I discovered when researching was that in 19th century America, there was this whole underground of people passing. Women were passing as men. African Americans were passing as white people. And it was all about moving up in the world or bettering one's circumstance. And so it's not surprising to me that women didn't just pass as men to go into the army. Women passed as men to get better jobs in the factory. Um, and and I think the whole, you know, I think someone could write a whole book just on passing in the 19th century. Um, we have a question of how many women soldiers had to get an act of Congress to get their pension. Uh, there were a number of nurses who had to do that. As far as I'm aware, Sarah Edmonds was the only woman soldier who went to Congress to get her pension. Now, pension research is really fraught, or at least I found it so. I mean, we know that Albert Cashier drew a pension, but Albert Cashier was still living as a man and didn't have the identity issues that, say, Sarah Edmonds had, where she had to first prove that she was Franklin Thompson. When I was checking, 
pension indexes. You know, the major thing is to know what name to look under. And I did find a couple of women who had served as soldiers applied for their pension as a widow. So Mar uh, Martha Lindley, for example, she never sought to get her own pension. She filed as a widow of her husband. And I suspect that's because that was easier paperwork. You know, she didn't have, it was a lot easier to prove she was married than to prove that she had assumed this alias. Michael Hill has got his hand raised. Uh, Michael, if you uh, want to open your mic and ask your question. Right. Uh, do you know, uh, very good presentation. Uh, Thank you. Do you know if there are how many, if any, uh, women that were passing or tried to pass as, as men were captured on the recruitment physical? I suspect that happened, but if they got booted out before they enlisted, there's not really records of that that I could find. There was one, um, she was still a teenager. When she was captured, she did say that she had to go to three different recruitment centers until she found a surgeon who was not doing the job properly so she could finally sneak in. Um, Daryl asked, were there any black women? And yes, we were able to document three. Now, I don't think that's the extent of women of uh, women of color who served, but I think it, again, it's the problem of documentation and it was given the, the climate and the racism of the time, I would suspect less attention was paid to individual black soldiers. And, and as we know, just your common soldier, your your common soldier in the ranks, no one's paying a lot of attention to that individual unless he does something great or does something terrible. But uh, we did discover uh, at least two women in the USCT, and there was a third woman, Mar uh, Maria Lewis, who not only passed as a man, she passed as a white man, and served in a New York Cavalry Regiment. And she is someone who's documented in Julia Wilbur's diary, but we lose her again at the end of the war. So this is an interesting question. Is there any difference in the attitude towards women disguised as men or women who were openly uh, working during the war such as, um, you know, women who were known to be spies. I think there were, well, we have to look at how people were viewed in their own time versus how we look at them today. And, you know, you take Elizabeth Van Loo, she was not appreciated very well in her lifetime, probably because she never left Richmond. I think that when women, it was all about how women soldiers presented themselves. So the women who were discovered and all of a sudden there's a newspaper reporter who wants to know their whole life story and then report it completely wrong. The women who immediately defaulted to the acceptable Victorian narrative the women who said, I did this because I loved my country. I did this because I loved a man. Those women socially seem to more or less get a pass. At least the newspapers treated them very well. And very few women who were publicly interviewed, say by the press, very few of them would admit publicly if they had a different motive for joining. You know, uh, 
we know that we know that Rosetta Wakeman's primary motive for going into the army was the paycheck. Had someone asked Rosetta Wakeman what her motive was, I'm not sure she would have admitted to that. She admits it into her letters to her family. Of course, she didn't live to have a reporter, you know, speak to her. This may uh, go to uh, what you were talking about too. Uh, Don Mack has asked uh, more about the memoirs after the fact. Um, you know, did they um, uh, present the true stories after the fact about why they got in? No, uh, it only two women soldiers wrote their memoirs. Sarah Edmonds and Loretta Velazquez were the only two. Now that makes sense because since most women soldiers came from the working class, they were not exceptionally literate. If you look at Rosetta Wakeman's letters, um, you can tell she had minimal schooling. So Sarah Edmonds and Loretta Velazquez are already slightly different from most women who served in that they were literate um, and very well read. But if you read Sarah Edmonds' memoirs, not once does she say that she is pretending to be a man. And she makes a lot of stuff up. I mean, obviously. She needed, she wanted to write a bestseller. And so her book is, cannot be taken on face value. Absolutely cannot be taken on face value. It's a fun read. You know, she, she models it after the, um, the adventure penny novels of the day. And so I, I'm not even sure I would classify it as an autobiography or a memoir. It's, it's a really good adventure story. If you want to know about her real military service, her pension file is probably the best source for that because in the pension file, she had to document exactly what she did and her comrades write about their service with her. And when Sarah Edmonds wrote her memoirs, her memoirs are all about God and country and how much she loved the United States and how much she felt that God wanted her to go do this. So it's very Victorian and it's, it was very much a conventional narrative. And she didn't dare write her true narrative. Now, when Loretta Velazquez wrote her narrative in 1876, Loretta Velazquez comes out and talks about wanting adventure and talks about wanting to be the next Joan of Arc and talks, you know, and she even talks some trash about some of the other men she encountered in the military. And she was, and her memoir, which is every bit the adventure story that Sarah Edmonds's memoir is, and, and written again in that sort of penny novel adventure style, the fact that Velazquez was honest about her motivations led her to be roundly criticized and not reach uh, the sales numbers that Sarah Edmonds did. Well, uh, Don Mack also, uh, Don, if you want to open up your mic and follow up, uh, feel free to do so. But Don is also uh, kind of raising the question about, yes, doctors or recruitment um, folks may have missed things or our doctors may have, but uh, when you're living in close quarters with other troops, you know, uh, Don says, uh, you know, six or so in a tent, how do you, how do you not get found out? How do well, you? Oh, that was easy. I mean, that was the easy part because we know that they're Victorians. They're not taking their clothes off at night. And in fact, depending on the weather, they're putting all their clothes on at night. So unlike us today that go put on our jammies, soldiers weren't putting on their jammies at night. They were sleeping in their uniform. So women were way more likely to get discovered if 
they went off to a part of the woods to attend to sanitary matters and ran into somebody else. Um, the close quarters problem came in prisoner of war camps where women had nowhere to go for privacy. If you're in camp, if you're in a tent, you can find privacy however often you need that. And so it was really prisoner of war camps and barracks uh, that would lead to women being discovered. And hospitals, obviously, except for Rosetta Waitman, who somehow had chronic diarrhea in a hospital and no one wrote down that uh, she was not male. Yeah, this is Don Mack. I, I was just thinking, like, what about facial hair? Like, it was common for an infantry person who wasn't an officer to shave every so often, uh, whereas the officers had beards. You know, they, they typically sported beards. And I just wonder why wouldn't someone question, like, why aren't you, why don't you have facial hair? Because they didn't get to shave that often. <laughs> right, right. Um, in Albert Cashier, for example, one of her comrades later recalled that they used to make fun of Albert because he couldn't grow a beard. You know, it was a running joke. Hey, Albert, when are you going to get some facial hair? I, my sense is that because there were enough underage boys in the ranks or very young, you know, 17 saying they're 18 or younger. What I, what I really think is that most women were not passing for full grown men. They were passing as teenage boys. And so that would explain the higher pitched voice. That would explain the lack of facial hair. And because there were enough boys lying about their age, it wouldn't seem so out of place. And so yeah, I, I guess I, they, could, they could just say late puberty or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, it sounds like um, because there were so few women that did this, or at least that we know about, this may not have helped um, in women's suffrage or in equality or in uh, integrating the military services with women. They, there were not enough uh, women doing this to demonstrate that they were as capable as as men. Um. Yeah, it was, it, it's an interesting to me because I always thought it was so interesting that so many women independently did the same thing. You know, there was no recruitment of women, obviously. So all these women who went to war passing as men came up with that idea on their own. And I've always thought that that was interesting, but it's one of the, sometimes gender historians get mad at me, <laughs> but the women who went to war during the Civil War. They didn't go to war to prove a point. They didn't go to war to advance the cause of women. They were, in many cases, reacting to the oppression of women during their time. But it was a personal response. It was a personal rebellion. It was women who were using the army, who were passing as men to improve their personal lives, not to improve women writ large. And the suffragists would later mention women soldiers in some of their writings as an example of why women should have full citizenship but the women themselves were not doing it to strike a blow at the patriarchy. They were doing it to improve their individual lives or they were doing it because they loved someone and didn't wanna be separated from them. 
And then what happens is another thing that surprised me when I was researching the subject is that during the Civil War, the fact that there were women in the ranks was not a secret. I mean, it was a secret which soldier was the woman, but there were enough newspaper articles about women being found out that at least the reading public knew that there were women. And then when General Sheridan gives a paragraph in his memoirs to two women soldiers that were under his command, the story was out there. And as long as the generations that lived through the war were still alive, then the knowledge that some women served as soldiers still existed. It was when the last um, Civil War participants died that the knowledge of women soldiers sort of died with them. And then uh, historians like myself then had to rediscover them. And, you know, I started my research in the 1990s. And so those of us who then rediscovered them, I mean, we were working sort of within the framework of women's history. So that's a very long winded sort of how it, it, it kind of has come full circle is that people knew about them. And then, and then Civil War participants died. And then the historians who wrote about the war, of course, until recent memory, most books about the Civil War was about the battles and the leaders. And it wasn't until people started really looking like at a bigger picture of the Civil War and the many facets of the Civil War that people started to rediscover women soldiers. Well, and um, I guess the fact that uh, some of these uh, women soldiers started uh, writing penny novels and going on a going on tours uh, suggested they were not in it for the, you know, for women's equality. And, but were there, but were there any uh, of these women soldiers that did go out and uh, promote women's rights? Not that I'm aware of, not that I'm aware of. And, and that doesn't really surprise me because again, in the post-war period, the women who were able to who were able to fight for suffrage and fight for women's rights, these were educated middle, upper middle class women who had the resources to try to elevate the position of women in society. Our women who went to war, they were women who were worried where their next meal was coming from. And, and I don't imagine that after the war, their circumstances, you know, were much elevated, particularly with the difficulty in getting pensions. So here's a really good question about as the war progressed and got bloodier, it got harder to recruit men. They probably looked the other way. Okay. So here is my, one of my favorite fun facts is... <laughs> The Confederate Army, by 1864, as a general rule, had stopped sending their women soldiers home. So usually, if you were a Union soldier and, if, and they found out you were female, they sent you home, for the most part. A couple got accused of being spies. But as a general rule, it's like, you're a girl, go home. In the Confederate Army, that was true. But in 1864... More than one Confederate soldier was captured during the Overland campaign. And these soldiers were obviously women to anybody who looked. Uh, one of them, Sarah Jane Perkins, who was with an artillery regiment, she had started to grow her hair out, you know, to the fact that she had a braid, which meant she had not been passing for a while. And there were other examples of the Confederates. I mean, definitely by 1864, with the severe lack of manpower and the desertions and everything that was was going on, 
they 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 kept their women. If they found a woman in the ranks, they kept her because they needed literally anyone and everyone at that point. And the heck with gender propriety. Did they pick up bounty? Um, you know, uh, yes. Uh, yeah. 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 Ros- Rosetta Wakeman was all about that bounty. Right. And probably uh, a bunch of men probably paid the 300 bucks to get, get some women in there. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Did, uh, uh, what was the general public perception of uh, this situation once the women were found out? Uh, I mean, there, you said there were stories in the newspapers, but uh, were, were these women accepted? Uh, not the ones that were going on tour and writing novels, but just generally did uh, were they looked upon disfavorably or favorably by uh, the non-military families or, or just the general public? Well, as far as the newspapers were concerned, is if the women acted contrite, and if they professed love of, like I said, if they if they said, well, I did it because I loved a man or I did it because I loved my country, then the newspapers kind of were like, isn't this cute? Isn't she great? And, you know, we wish her well. And it was... You know, obviously, at least in, in, in the way that women soldiers were written about in the newspaper, for the most part, you know, the, the reporters, you know, they just thought it was was cute and and it was a little bit of public interest. And then, of course, no one followed up with them once they got home. And I can't really speak to what their life what their civilian life was like because so many of them either died, you know, like Wakeman or I lose them, you know, so many of them it, it trying to follow them into the post-war era was just, it's like they vanished like so many people do. And if, and, and especially for the women that went into the army because it was an escape, it was a step up. They didn't want to be found when they were in the army. And I almost got the feeling that they didn't want to be found in civilian life. You know, they, who's to say that they didn't then just create another persona when they moved on. And so it makes it, it makes it so hard to, to track them in the historical record. You know, I can't look for them in the census because I don't know what their name was. Right, you don't have uh, family members or friends necessarily writing about them and their stories and what they felt about it necessarily, or if they did, it's hard to find. Right, right. And I'm sure, like, you know, Shelby Harrell, for example, is someone who's really taken up this research and moved it forward, which makes me really happy. I think that there's what Lauren and I found, but I have always remained convinced that there's so much more to learn about this subject. And I get really excited whenever anyone sort of wants to pick up and try to move it forward. So if you want a challenge, go research women soldiers. <laughs> I know there's one question here about what percentage of troops were female, but uh, I think you said at the outset that, that was hard to tell. And uh, But they did ask whether it was more prevalent in the Union or the Confederate troops. Okay, so from, from what we know is it kind of follows the larger patterns of the Army. So in our research, we found two Union for every Confederate which sort of matches up to to the percentages of the armies themselves. So that made some sense to me. Um, As far as what percentage of troops were women, I mean, honestly, it's insignificant 
even, I mean, I can say we will never know how many women served and we'll never be able to document them all. But even if we could, I would say that when you look at just the numbers of men who served, you know, the women are statistically irrelevant and, and that the service of women made no difference in the outcome of any part of the war. So, so to me, their significance isn't, isn't in their numbers, but in the fact that they were there at all. And especially in the Victorian era where gender roles and hierarchies were so locked tight that there were women who just refused to stay where society told them they had to be. And I think that even though they weren't doing that for women's rights, that they still moved things ahead. And for later generations, there's someone to look at and say, they were so freaking brave. Well, here's the $64 question then is, uh, were the women uh, troops, uh, were they uh, taken advantage of by the other troops? Uh, you know, somebody saying, I'm gonna tell, tell on you. And, um, you know, is, was, was there that kind of thing that went on? Um, not that I found. I would say that these were women who were trained soldiers. So they may not have been as helpless as perhaps a civilian woman if attacked. They would know how to defend themselves. And also no one's gonna hit on them unless they know they're women. And women who were detected as women were generally booted out. So, so we don't have any evidence of that. And, but I would say that if a predator wanted to pick on a woman, they might not want to pick on a woman soldier. They would probably go after a civilian woman who would be perceived as helpless. Um, uh, Janet Whaley has got a question. Janet, if you want to open up your mic and ask your question. Thank you, um, Deanne. Since you were one of the early historians to kind of break into the field of women's history, what do you feel has been the the progress on this area of scholarship? Well, I, you're very kind, Janet. I don't. I was I was perhaps one of the early women to write about women in the military. Um, I think that in, in the larger area of civil war studies that we're seeing a lot more attention being paid to women's roles and just looking at civil war conferences over the past 30 years and civil war roundtables, a lot more women's voices are being heard and a lot more stories are being researched about, about the broader role of women in the Civil War. I know when we founded the Society for Women in the Civil War, we founded it because the other Civil War conferences weren't giving hardly any attention to women. I mean, Clara Barton couldn't even get a panel. And so we decided to go off and do our own conference where we could showcase research about women and about 19th century women and women in the Civil War. And that was in the early 90s. And in the past 30 some years, while I was active, I did see progress and not just progress in, in researching and writing about 50% of the population during the war, but also writing about non-battles topics and looking at the civil war from social point of view, looking at the civil war from uh, larger economic points of view, looking at what role 
the war took on the civilian population. And I think, I think that our understanding of the civil war is so much richer when we look at life off the battlefield as well as on the battlefield. And so I, there's a lot of good research that's been done in women's history, that's been done in African-American history, and I'm, I'm here for it. Well, let me uh, follow up that question, and that's a good one, um, because of your experience with the National Archives, and um, there's probably things that the Library of Congress and other uh, depositories, uh, how, much, how, many, how much material is buried in at the archives or at the Library of Congress or at these other places <laughs> that actually nobody looks at and would reveal some wonderful research projects on not just women soldiers, but, you know, women in the Civil War, women antebellum or during Reconstruction. Uh, you know, are there materials that you remember when you were there that nobody looked at, but they were there? Um, there at the National Archives or at the uh, Library of Congress or other places where, you know, they're just collecting dust and you know, it's a perfect project for somebody to look at, but nobody is. Well, um, I know that Michelle Kroll is around here somewhere and I know that she could speak to resources at the Library of Congress. Um, at you know, I, I spent my career immersed in 18th and 19th century army records. And it was sort of, it was my passion to see what I could find out about women and civilians in this very uh, masculine set of records. And what I found was that the US Army documented everything. They're, they were amazing. They wrote it all down they would write about their own atrocities. They would write about civilian populations. Now, you can go through these War Department records, especially records that were kept out in the field, uh, fort records. If you wanna know about civilians, look at the records of army forts because particularly the surgeon wouldn't just treat people at the fort, civilians would come to the fort for medical care. And, and then there were, of course, civilians at the fort. And so army post records, particularly the records kept by the surgeon, are an amazing resource to look at 19th century civilians who came into contact with the army. I would also say that records of the Freedmen's Bureau have a lot of information about life for African Americans. And, and then if you want to really, if you want more information about post-war civilians, if you go to the records of army commands because they were enforcing martial law and reconstruction in the South. Um, RG-393 Part 1 would have uh, records of your reconstruction districts. RG-393 Part 5 is going to have fort records. And so, yeah, Army command records. There's, there's a lot of good stuff in there. And, but it's so voluminous. And not everybody can just go sit in the archives day after day looking for, for that gold mine. Uh Kurt, uh, Michelle Crowell, who is an invaluable asset at the Library of Congress in the Archives Division, uh, I, I want to open it up. Uh, Michelle, is there anything you want to add to uh, what Deanna has said? Yeah, I was finding women who were testifying, you know, who had to uh, complain to provost marshals about things that were happening in their communities or um, court, ma court martial records. If, um, you know, if, a, if a woman was raped, sometimes they would, they would bring a complaint and testify. Um, you know, again, for, for my sources, USCT widows pensions were a gold mine in terms of 
uh, getting a sense of communities and relationships and thing and things of, of, along those lines. So you know, with particularly with National Archives records, because you're very much looking at um, federal records, and and I echo particularly for the union, boy, you know, you you want the obsessive record keepers because you know they're going to write down things, and some of it is a matter of of bringing a different question to in a different perspective to records that people have looked at. So, you know, mm -hmm. Favolia Glimp was just saying on a on a um, presentation that I saw uh, of hers lately, you know, she spent a lot of time looking at the official records for her recent book because it was, you know, the material was there. It's just if you're looking for battles and you're not really looking for the civilians. So, you know, I can't say enough about the government records at the National at the Library of Congress you know, we have a lot of records. And again, you have to, sometimes it's, it's looking in plain sight. Uh, thank you very much, Dan, for such a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Mm -hmm.